Thank you for tuning in today. I'm your host, Pastor Asa Dockery, coming to you from the Sanctuary of War Harvest Church North. We have services on Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. and Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. If you live anywhere in this region, we invite you to come out and be a part of an anointed service. Sometimes when you uh, listen to it on television, it doesn't give you the same impact of being here live and in the presence of God with the body of believers. So I invite you to come out. Today we're bringing you a brand new word. It's entitled, Pleasing to God. When God created you and when he created me, he didn't create us after someone else's image. He created us according to his image and his likeness. Why did he do that? There are many truths in this word today that's going to bless your heart. So you just hang on and check this out. I'll be back in a little bit. Subject entitled, Pleasing to God. Uh, too many times we're consumed by pleasing either ourselves or someone else, and God wants us to please him. Now, the reason why he wants us to please him is because he is able then to grant us liberty. God wants us to have liberty. He wants us to have freedom. And so uh, he's given me this word to help us understand what that may entail. Uh, Genesis 2.15, it says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. So he gave him a purpose, didn't he? Right. I don't see where God gave Adam a choice. He put him in the garden and says, Here, boy, keep it. Tend it. Cultivate it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Now, when people think of liberty or freedom, they think that freedom gives them the ability to do whatever they want. And when you have that perception or that mindset of what liberty or freedom is, you have a tendency to abuse it. Uh, in that, if that were the definition of freedom or liberty, to be able to do whatever you want, we see that that wasn't the case in the beginning when God created man, and this is before the fall, y'all. He gave him his purpose. He didn't ask Adam, do you want to do this? He told him to do it. Right? Not only that, he gave him commandments of what not to do. So he limited the scope, the freedom that Adam would have and enjoy. But inside the context of God's purpose and God's commandments, there is liberty. There is freedom. And God wants us to have that liberty and freedom and to experience it so that we're not in bondage to sin or man. Now, if you should get in your mind, I don't want to t let God, allow God to tell me what to do. I don't want God's commandments to limit my life to where I cannot enjoy the pleasures of this great world he created. After all, he created uh, uh, pharmaceuticals. He did. He created marijuana. So I want to enjoy these things. But the problem with that is when all things are permissible but not all things are advantageous for me is what Paul said. I can do all things but I will not be brought into bondage to anything. And so when we step outside of God's will, outside of God's protective boundaries, we place ourselves into bondage. So we say, well, I want to do this, and I'm going to do it. You, you can offer Jesus to everyone, but you can't force him on anyone. God puts it in his word, whosoever will, let them come. He invites you. He invites us to partake of his goodness, to taste and see that he is good, and to enjoy his blessings. But he's not going to make you. He gives you free will to choose something else if that's what you want to do. So look there in Genesis 1 and 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the sea. Who gave them dominion? God did. 
God did. Dominion, authority, comes from God. Let them have dominion, but look what it says they're to have dominion over. Fish of the sea, birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man, as he had said, in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them, and God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful, fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion, once again, over all the animals on the earth. Now, this is deep. Hang with me. When God created man, he did not create us in the image and likeness of man. See, I told you that was going to be deep. God created both male and female in his own image and likeness. In other words, we're not to pattern ourselves after man. We're to pattern ourselves after God. God never intended for man or woman to be our role models. He wanted to be our role model. God created us in his image so that we would seek him out, that we may know him and desire to become like him since he is, after all, our creator. Who better knows you than your manufacturer? Right? He created us so that we could have an intimate and personal relationship with him, and it's through that relationship we could become and do all that he created us to fulfill for his glory. Now, no matter how many times God liberated his chosen people, the Jews, and sought to have a close and personal relationship with them, there seemed to always be a stumbling block that hindered or prevented this from occurring. This happened uh, in the very beginning with the first man and woman. God says, this is what you shall do. This is what you shall not do. And that's exactly what they did. They did what God told them not to do. They sinned against God. They rejected God. But when you reject God, keep this in mind, you're rejecting God's freedom. You're, you're rejecting God's liberty. You're rejecting God's authority to operate in your life. And you will have no power. Now, they chose to partake of sin rather than eating of the tree of life, which was there in the garden with the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And through eating or partaking of the tree of life, they would have become like their creator. Something seems to always stand in the way of preventing man and God from becoming one. Is that not true? It's like people come into church, they get, they get saved from their sin, they get set free, and then they start working on the relationship with God, and it seems like something pops up in their life that wants to suck them out of the church so they don't work on the relationship of becoming one with God. And that's the same with nations. God will raise up a nation, and, and like America, he raised up a nation for the purpose of, one, evangelizing the world, Right? This, one of the sole purposes of America is to evangelize the world. We've sent missionaries around the world throughout our history. The other is to be an ally to Israel. We're failing in both. And so there always seems to be something that prevents man from becoming one with his God. Now, as you read, read in these verses, uh, verse 26 through uh, 28, as you read in these verses where God has blessed them and given them both male and female, delegated authority, he gave it to both of them, right? You don't see any reference where God gives man authority to rule over man. Now let this soak in. God wants you to, he wants you to tend and keep the garden, right? He wants you to stay away from the tree of knowledge, good and evil. And, and, and other than that, you're at liberty to do what you want to. Man says, no, I don't want to do that. I don't enjoy your freedom. Matter of fact, I feel like I'm being controlled by you. So I want to do this. The one thing you said not to, that's exactly what I want to do because I find that there's freedom in that. I can be like God if I do that. And we're still buying into the same life. Now here's the problem with that problem. 
When you don't do what God says and you're not obedient to what God puts the parameters around you to keep you from, and you say, I'm going to go ahead and go outside these lines, you lose that freedom of being accountable directly to God, and then you come up under man's authority, and you're in bondage to sin and in bondage to man. Turn with me to Genesis 3.16. They have partaken of the tree of sin. Now God has passed judgment on uh, the man, the woman, and the serpent. Let's pick it up in verse 16 where God is addressing the woman. So God said to the woman, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. I think the New Living Translation says... Uh, you shall desire his affection, but he shall be your master. Now, it isn't until after the fall of man into sin, after they've rebelled against God's commandments, rebelled against God's purpose for their lives, that we read where God tells Eve that her desire will be for her husband, but he will rule over her. This wasn't God's original plan for husbands and wives. Can I get a witness? This is after the fall. This is the result or the curse or the consequences of Eve's sin. Can I get a witness there? But because Eve did sin, she had to bear the responsibility and the consequences of her sins. What was that? Her freedoms were greatly diminished. Instead of having a co-creator co with her, her husband who she was comparable help to, now she's in bondage to him. He's going to rule over her and dominate her, and we're seeing that in marriages today thousands of years later, are we not? Women being treated like slaves. Go, go over to, to Muslim countries and see how well their wives are treated. Not to mention the, the spousal abuse and the verbal abuse and sexual abuse of, of women by their husbands in America. We're seeing that curse being lived out, are we not? Now, did they have any of that problem in the garden before the fall? See, we don't want God telling us what to do as Americans, as Christians, but then we don't want to live with the consequences when we go out and do our own thing. Mm -hmm. Now, God created us in His image according to His likeness so that we would have and enjoy, get this, freedom for ourselves i don't have to run to some man and say uh, what do you say about this How, what should i do about this when i can go to the god who created me and put the gifts and the, the talents and abilities in me and gives me the wisdom to operate in that i can go to him and he can tell me directly what i am to do so so now we're under the fall we're under the consequences of the fall and we're under bondage to man and, and bondage to sin and to death. And we do not like it, but are we repenting and changing from our ways to go back to God? No. Now, God's original plan was design, designed in such a way that we would know God for ourselves and we wouldn't have to go through another human. When man sinned, God's original plan was altered and this interjected man into the relationship between God and mankind. This was the result of man's rebellion. Man came in between God and man. We see it now in Genesis 3.16. You will love your husband, you will desire your husband's affection, but instead you're going to get his domination. Now, look there in Exodus 3. We're only in the, second, the beginning of the second book of the Bible. It doesn't mean chronologically. It just means that's the way they canonized it. But I'm talking about early in the Bible. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. Now, Moses was tending the flock. Remember, he's a, a, on the run, a fugitive on the run. And God catches up with him. While he was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the, the what? The priest. The priest 
that word priest there, another word for priest is ruler. The ruler of Midian, Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will turn aside and see this great sight, why this bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. Or here, yeah, here I am. Then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry of the, uh, because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Now, God is about to give Moses a purpose, is he not? He says, I'm going to send you into Egypt, and you're going to be my mouthpiece to my people and to Pharaoh the king, and you're going to tell the king, let my people go. Now, the reason why the Lord led me to this particular scripture is because it is early in the Bible, but to, to show you that when man sinned, it brought us in bondage to man, and now God operates under that principle. God. What did I tell you a few Sundays ago? God gives you the keys to the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth, be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, be loosed in heaven. Whenever man says, I want to be under man and not under you, God, God allows it, and then he implements it in his word. That was not his original plan. And here we see in Exodus 3, we have the priest, never mentioned before, except a couple of times in Genesis, but it is a ruler over a people in Midian. You have Moses now, who is being sent by God to Egypt to talk to his people. And then you have the third king of Egypt, Pharaoh. These are three positions that are introduced in, in Exodus 3 that we did not see in Genesis 1. These two uh, spiritual positions of authority are presented here in this chapter, the priest, which is the ruler, and the prophet, God's mouthpiece, to man. Now, God is instituting these two positions of delegated authority, which he will use to communicate to the Jews. Now, in chapter 2, you will see the introduction of another type of authority, and I just mentioned that, the governing authority who rules over people to protect and to take care of the masses, men ruling people. Now, although God didn't, cre uh, didn't begin creation, placing man over mankind, we already see in Exodus that God is implementing various offices of authority to carry out his will on the earth as it pertains to worship, and to governing. Now, just as we saw where both Adam and Eve refused to please God and do his will, but chose to please themselves, you see in Exodus where Pharaoh doesn't even know God. But he has interjected, Pharaoh has interjected his will over God's people, and God is displeased with the king. He, Pharaoh is using God's chosen people whom he created to be in his image and his likeness and to have liberty and to own the earth. Psalm 2, I believe it is, or Psalm 1, you can correct me. Ask of me and I will give you the nations of the earth for an inheritance. Psalm 2. God wanted to use Israel as a witness as a symbol of liberty and freedom of what he could do through a small sect of people that would place their faith and their trust in him. And, the, and, and so now they're in Egypt. 
They've been in bondage now for almost, four, well, 400 years. I don't know when they actually went into bondage there. And, and there was a king that rose up that did not know Joseph, and he treated the, the children of Israel uh, with uh, disdain and, and used them to build his kingdom, in other words. And now they're living in bondage there in uh, Egypt. And Pharaoh is teaching God's people the, about the idols and the idolatry of Egypt. God's not pleased with this, so God does something about it. God chose to use Egypt to reintroduce himself to the world and his chosen people by overthrowing Pharaoh and his mighty army. Yet the Jewish people would not have it God's way, so they rejected the Lord as their king. Think about that. God is trying to teach the Jews throughout the Old Testament, 4,000 years of history, God tried to break Jews from wanting to put their faith in man and consistently and constantly they rejected God and they put their faith in man and lived in bondage to him. Turn with me to uh, 1 Samuel 8. I bet you're sitting there wondering, I wonder where he's going with this to your house. God knows exactly where we roost. Now, 1 Samuel 8, it says, Now it came to pass, when Samuel was old, that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now, this also came out of uh, Exodus, where Moses is ruling over the affairs of Israel, and Jethro, his father-in-law, watches the drain, this, this toll that judging the affairs of all of Israel has on his son-in-law, Moses, and it concerns him, and he says, Moses, this is not wise what you're doing. You're going to give yourself out, then you'll be no good to nobody. Why don't you appoint some men and let them rule over the small affairs, and then when they have some big issues, uh, let them bring those big issues up to you. That sounds to me like the institution of judges. Now, we've got Moses, the, the, the prophet. You've got Jethro, the priest. You've got the king. And now you've got the introduction of judges ruling over the affairs of man. Now it's getting more involved, right? Now this went on, the judges went on up until the time of Samuel and, and then the prophet uh, where he made his sons judges over Israel. And so it gives all that. But his sons did not walk, verse 3, in his ways. They turned aside and dishonored for dishonest gain. We're seeing that now. The judges, instead of giving rulings on laws, they're trying to legislate laws. And, and for gain. And, and these in the uh, first Samuel, the sons of uh, Samuel, took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Now they're wanting to go from being under judges to being under one king. So that they can be like what? All the other nations. Did God want that for them? Absolutely not. He did not want him, Israel to become like every other nation. He wanted them to be set apart, a peculiar people, a holy nation, right? But the children of Israel said, no, we're tired of this. We want a king like everybody else has. But this thing displeased Samuel when they said, uh, give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. Now watch this. Did God override the will of the people? No. Then the Lord said to Samuel, heed the voice of the people in all they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me that I should not rule over them. What's going to happen when you say, I've had enough of God, I've had enough of church, I'm tired of hearing about the Word, I don't want this. If you walk out, 
you're putting yourself in bondage to man and God will allow it and you will lose your freedom, then you will curse the man because he won't let you have the freedom. You won't let me have but just a cell phone for all the taxpayer money I've given into the government. That's all you'll give me is a lousy cell phone. God says, I'll give you the earth. But that wasn't enough for you. So now you've got to settle for a cell phone. <laughs> Told you he'd come find you where you're roosting. God says, they, re they did not reject you, Samuel. They rejected me that I should not rule over them or reign over them according to all the works which they have done since the day. See, according to all the works that they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt unto this day with which they have forsaken me and served other gods. They didn't want the freedom of the, the living God. They wanted to go and serve other gods and be in bondage to them. So they are doing to you also. Wow. Once again, like Adam and Eve rejected God and chose to partake of sin, Israel is rejecting God as their king. Instead of being God's peculiar people in the earth, they wanted a man and to be like every other nation. Hard to believe we're already out of time. There's so much more to this word. I'd love for you to order the CD or the DVD so you can sit down and watch it in its entirety. This is a very important prophetic word to the body of Christ, and we need to get this word in our spirit so that we understand how we can be totally liberated by looking unto God and not to man and to live according to God's laws and not man's laws. So I encourage you to order uh, either your if you want a CD or a DVD, do that through our church office. You can contact our office personnel. Let them know the title of the message, Pleasing to God, and we'll get it sent out to you. The information to contact our office is at the bottom of the screen. Also, if you have any prayer requests or uh, praise reports of what God's done in your life through us agreeing with you in prayer for whether it's your marriage or finances, we've had many prayer requests come in for different things, and we are praying seriously over these prayer requests. We're hearing pressure reports, and we want to hear from you. Also, before we leave, I want to encourage you to uh, sit down and pray about uh, sending in a love offering to help this ministry stay on the air where you're watching it. It calls for airtime. It calls for production. And we're glad that God has given us this opportunity. And we'd love for you to be a part of this and stand with this ministry so that more people like yourself can be strengthened and encouraged on a weekly basis through the word that comes forth from this pulpit to your heart. And we're grateful for that. So will you do that? Pray about it and just let God lead you in it. We would appreciate it. Till this time next week, may God richly bless you. We pray that you've been impacted by today's message. If you need more information or would like to contact us, visit us on our website at whcnorth.org or contact us by phone at 706-374-6175. To write us, our address is P.O. Box 968, Morganton, Georgia, 30560. Our campus is located at 135 Bud Franklin Drive, Blairsville, Georgia, 30512. 